Hello, hello. It is Kenyon here. It is Basketball Rewind. Everyone subscribe, of course. I am joined by the usual suspects in Beyond the Locker Room, Coach Roach, as well as a new guest. But I have been on his podcast, of course. So this is just, you know, it's been a long time coming, by the way. Um, running off the screen. Oh, man. <laughs> the man that they call Mac, the myth, the legend. Um, I know you're not joined by your, uh, or you. I think you are the Obi Wan to his, uh, you know, whatever. But this is Mac. So oh, Curly, yeah, yes, Curly. <laughs> uh, how are you doing, Mac? I'm doing good. Uh, had a busy day with the kids, and I'm ready to talk some hoops with some uh, rising legends, some underground kings here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know it looks like it, eh? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I understand. I, one day, one day. Um, and for the for the rest of you guys, how are you guys doing? All right, man. Doing okay, man. Looking forward to the conversation. Uh, okay, so before we really jump into it, uh, Coach, you, you're, you're doing well. Doing well. Looking forward to our conversation, and welcome to Mac. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sadly, we are uh, doing better than uh, Canada basketball because it looks like, um, uh, sadly, Murray will not be joining the team for this run. Um, now, I, if anyone in the comments would like to comment on, you know, do the, I don't think that they have to win it, but I do think that they have to medal in this tournament to win the Olympic to get to win an, an Olympic berth, I should say. Um, if that is different, please comment down below. Let me know. Um, do you guys have any comments? Yeah, I think it's they have to be top. I two. think they have to make the final. You have to be in the finals. Have to be final. Okay, I thought it was top two in the region. Okay. 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 Yeah, fair so enough. Yeah, basically, as long as they're they're in the gold medal game, mm. they are successful. If they're in I bronze, that's what it is. Yeah, it's but... possibly a failure. Okay. Um, I will I will remember that. Um, okay. So. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, I was a little bit surprised because, you know, we were talking about this before beyond you, you mentioned it as well, but you know, Murray kind of sounded like he was going to be kind of hopeful for this tournament in terms of gearing up and actually playing some games. And after seeing the last time, uh, that they suited up, I mean, I, it was a good game. I think they could have used the gravity of another top level scorer, um, to help, Jay out a little bit at times. Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that really quick. Coach, you've been kind of following them a lot more than the rest of us, so I'll give you <laughs> more, man. <laughs> well, there's part of me that I'm not shocked, but it's so last minute, I think. Like, I was looking forward to seeing Jamal Murray suit up, but I, I, I do think he is, I don't know how many months or a year removed from that ACL injury that he had, plus going into the finals the extensive playoff run that they had. I'm not shocked that they're going to pump the brakes on this a little bit, or even if Jamal says, you know, I'm I'm going to take the rest and I'm going to maybe more prioritize the Denver Nuggets for now. Now, if Canada makes the Olympics, I'm sure that he'll, he'll want to go. But, um, you know, I, I was looking forward to seeing arguably the best backcourt in this world, in or sorry, in FIBA but with him and Shea. I, I don't think that there is another pairing. You, I know the Americans are a really strong team, but I can't think of anyone who would be a better pairing than Jamal Murray and Shea Gilders Alexander. One's an all NBA player. The other one's an NBA champion right now. Um, and Jamal Murray, you know, he, from watching the games, Shea has had to do a lot. And there's a fair amount of ISO ball that's run um, with Shea kind of the number one option. If you put Jamal Murray on the court with him, it would open up his game so much. Like, and Jamal Murray can be that guy too, along with Shea, and what Shea can play off of him. But um, I'm, I was looking forward to it, but at the same time, I'm not shocked by this news. You know, if he wants to make another run with Denver next year for a title, and then you got to play all summer with Canada and then go into the season. That's taxing on your body for sure. So I think it's uh, I, I I think I'm not I'm not surprised by this decision. So I'm sorry, uh, Coach. You you probably know the answer to this. So with Murray, he was on the roster as far as like his name was listed, right? 
did that yes. handcuff them into a situation where they they could have just had somebody else there who could help out, and now it kind of put them in a spot where they lose a body? Like, how Good does that question. Work? And I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if we can just go and grab another player because I know uh, Kenyon and I, we've kind of spoke about who that player might be or a couple of guys, but we're, I'm not sure if they're able to add any more um, to the roster list. Yeah, that's unfortunate because, uh, I mean, that team seems like they need a little bit more shooting from the guard spot because that's what you would probably be getting most out of Jamal with, right? The, the spacing there. That's interesting. Do you think they have a shot at the gold medal? Yes. No. <laughs> but it's <laughs> slim now. Yeah, it's um they have a shot, but it's not gonna be easy. I would not I would not bet on this, people. Um I'm not sponsored by any betting anything. Um but don't. Um <laughs> <laughs> I have some quotes here from Murray in this case here from the article here. This is from ESPN, Windhorse. Quote, when I came into training camp, I wanted to see how my body would respond after a long and demanding season and if I would be physically able to compete at the highest level required for the World Cup. Close quote. Murray said in a statement, quote, in, cons in consultation with medical staff and the team, it's clear that additional recovery is required. and I have made the difficult decision to not participate in the tournament. End quote. So the team pretty much say like, dude, you ain't ready. Right. <laughs> Which is, I, I think yeah. that that's good that it, they had like a mutual, like we need to do what's, what's right for you. I, I did see a few um, comments from uh, the typical Leafs type fan saying, <laughs> well, if he was an NFL or sorry, NHL player, he, he you know, he'd strap on this, the skate one, like, and let's get over that. Um, <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. Um, people health health matters uh you know and like your livelihood goes goes more than that um but i think we have enough to um you know i i think it's top two uh mac mentioned uh, uh silver medal i think you have a solid shot at both i really do so that's good I'll say that. i thought we did too until i saw germany i didn't realize how good germany was i know we beat them recently but that would, we that went down to the wire, you know. Yeah, so, bronze is nice, isn't he? <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> and Dennis, Dennis is playing well. Yeah, it is. It's a sore I will go down that road. We no, no, yeah, we, <laughs> we, I'll not, just leave that. Not, not today, people. <laughs> not today. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'll just say this from the standpoint of the, the Canadian team: they got some real. I, I just don't like. There's certain teams I like. Now a team like like you know that um. Like um, Luca and his team, like now a team like that now becomes a dangerous team for them because just Luca just going wild for a game, he could overwhelm that team now if that he's healthy. Really, yeah, because he, he was he he missed the the last game or whatever. I I don't think it's anything That's serious. But here, man, like Luca's play, like, Luca's drink a beer and play the next day. Like Luca ain't worried about that, man. <laughs> he's thinner though this off season. I know. It's slim true. Luca. I know. We'll see what happens when he gets back to Dallas because that's always the case for him, man. He's always slim yes. when he's playing international. And that six <laughs> week boy, he's make he's make up for life at that point. Those six weeks, man. <laughs> and Dallas he training gets back to the Texas barbecue. Yeah. Bingo. <laughs> and he's back. Yep. To, he's back to mid mid size Luca. The quote. Yeah, Bert. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um. So for the rest of the the uh the the show today, we're going to not really be talking about Raptors again. I'm going to be transitioning between Raptors and NBA stuff here and there because again, it's basketball rewind. It's not Raptors re rewind. Um, if it was Raptors rewind, it'd eventually get a little bit boring for me. So uh, as much as I do love the Raptors, uh, we will talk about a little bit of, of stuff to do with the Raptors though, because I think that this topic touches on that, but we're going to talk about the injury tax for the rest of the episode. So to kind of uh, talk about this idea, it's the notion, and and uh, beyond, please correct me uh, if, if you feel like there's a better way that I can explain it, but essentially, the injury tax idea talks about the notion that if you have a star, and then you have another star, and one of those stars is very, say, injury prone, and I'll use one example before we go into the other examples, so Kawhi is a good example, right? Um, and 
that now puts a lot more pressure on Paul George to do the heavy lifting, which in turn makes Paul George less durable over time, as well as within a season. And that can kind of become a compound issue over time again and again and again. Um, there's other examples. We could talk about them in a second. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, is there anything that you guys want to add to just the idea before we really dive in? No, I mean, I think you know, you hit, you hit it in the head. There's been some other examples. I mean, funny enough, the Clippers again in this case, you know, Chris Paul and Blake Griffin. I mean, it seems the yep. Clippers always to be the, in the middle of these things. I don't know. They might have to check out their scouting when it comes to these type of things. But, you know, but I think there's um, there's something to it, I think. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm sure analytics guys have done all their research on not just individuals, but in this case, maybe finding equations. I suspect that's the next form if they haven't done of the you know, sports medical science and analytics tied together of like certain players not being paired well together in this case and say, you know what, put this guy with this guy. This is not going to end well for both players in this case here. I even see a little bit. He was a bit slightly injury prone in, in Los Angeles and New Orleans, early New Orleans, but Brandon Ingram seems to be increasing with injuries now, you know, as time's gone on now. And I'm not saying because of who you know who, but I'm just saying someone's like a lot of barbecuing, like a lot of catfish and, and stuff like that, perhaps in this case. And jambalaya. <laughs> jambalaya. As a side note, you just you just reminded me of the uh in terms of pairing the guys together. I, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Zodiac guy on, on Twitter. The guy who's <laughs> obsessed with trying to pair guys together based on zodiac size. And no, I was like, man, oh, it works, man, but he wasn't too chart or whatever. <laughs> Hey man, he he had it all figured out. I'll just say yeah. that he, he he's he's got it more figured out than uh, than some front offices. So yeah. Um. So Mac, uh, any thoughts before we dive into it? Uh, on the injury talks? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we we won't go down the zodiac route today. That's <laughs> oh, oh my! God. Imagine in your war room, you have like a bunch of zodiac signs. Of who are you gonna draft? But um, yeah, I mean, hey, yeah. Uh, the guy the guy was actually like people were like, well, what about? He's just like, well, this guy's the the moon sign of the thing, and this is why this didn't work out, and had historical data of all these signs and stuff. But uh, again, oh, man, another another that's a show on its own. I'll have to get that guy in at some point is just to pick his brain because it was it was interesting. Uh, but yeah, the injury I've, tax. I've... <laughs> I feel like, I mean, the injury tax is another, it's a downfall from not having good roster construction as well, like, because you don't really have the depth to rely on, so there's a lot of heavy lifting. And we kind of seen that a little bit with the Raptors these last couple of years that Nick Nurse had, he had the choice to play his bench, but he wasn't really um, confident in the bench, and it kind of wore our players down. OG Ananobi, Fred Van Vliet, um, I know Pascal had freak injury, so that, that's a real thing. And I, again, I think it just comes down to roster construction. A lot of these teams are top heavy and they pay the price. And that's why you have a team like the Nuggets who had their injury concerns because they had players, but because of their way of balancing out the roster, eventually they were able to kind of like um, weather the storm a little bit with a little bit nicks and bruises down the, down the stretch. And just on a side note, there's one other one in this case here, Ben Simmons from Philadelphia. I mean, he was held yep. as a horse, but played a ton of minutes with Embiid out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Early That's years. That's a good point. Yeah. I think the one for me that really comes to mind, and it was a little bit last year, but definitely two years ago, was KD, Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. um, we had the COVID incident where, where Kyrie couldn't play because he wasn't vaccinated. So it was just Harden and KD. And then if you guys remember from the playoffs, Harden had a bad hamstring. So you had Kevin Durant, 18 months, 24 months removed from an Achilles tear, and that always takes a little bit of time, and not many NBA players have come back from an Achilles tear. I think the only one I heard about who came back fairly well was Dominique Wilkins. Um, Kevin Durant is the best one I've seen come back from the Achilles tear. Not even Kobe. Kobe was a bit older, but still, he never was quite the same after his Achilles tear. But I took out Cousins too, right? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it, same thing. Exactly. Yeah, with, with DeMarcus Cousins, that's a good one. Um, but with KD, if you watch the playoffs, like they were up, I think, three games to two on Milwaukee or something like that. And Durant had like his toe on the line, more or less. And that would have been um, to advance. But uh, it went overtime. Then Milwaukee won, I think, the next game um, that year because Durant was basically. The, the number one, the number two, and the number three option for, for for Brooklyn offensively going up against Giannis in his prime, more or less, with 
the team that Milwaukee had. So, I mean, I think Durant's a pretty good example of, of, of the injury tax where he just wore down in the playoffs. Side note, game seven of that series, underrated great game. <laughs> they went overtime. That, that, I mean, you see alpha versus alpha. Like, no one's giving it an answer. Like, people kind of just like, smooth over that game because everyone talks about the toe on the line. But you forget about like That game was just ridiculous. <laughs> and because wow. Atlanta was the other game of I don't want the dunk, that was the other thing that happened that weekend. So that, got kind of, that game kind of got lost to I don't want to dunk and Philadelphia collapsing. And everyone kind of forgot about that game because it was on the same weekend. You know, and Shaq doing his Hawks and Brenner, right? Like all that. <laughs> but that game was ridiculous. Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think really good points. So I think, you know what, we'll, we'll go through the examples in a second, but I, you know, we've, I guess we've kind of already touched upon why that happens. One of the things that we haven't really talk, talked about is maybe um, things to do with scheduling or I think the accumulation of problems. Like when does this start for me? I personally, I always attribute a lot of injury stuff to AAU and like the toll that you you put on your body very early on, at, even in your childhood years where they're playing sometimes eight games in a weekend. Um full games full full court <laughs> you know um they don't they don't play like that in the pros i'll tell you that so um and they definitely don't play like that in college so to go from i think the aau i think the aau circuit is more grueling than an nba minutes in a you know season type schedule it just it's it's just more grueling I mean, and the AAU doesn't have the NBA level conditioning and, and strength uh, programs to keep them going. No. no, 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 and even even then, like, when do you start like strength and conditioning at the right time, um, and in the right ways on a body that's still essentially maturing? Uh, it's a tough okay. question. I have a counter to that, and I'm wondering. And this, we're going to find out real soon, next five, six years, maybe. But so let me still back to high school. I don't think it's a coincidence that the top players in this case that came up from high school during that generation, most of them have had some of the longest careers we could think of in modern history. Kobe played 20. LeBron's in 20. Garnett played at 18. Um, even a guy, Josh Smith, played like 12 or something like that. Like, you know, like you just keep going down the list. You know, the guys are actually able to make it. There's going to be some failures in this case here. We picked up one guy on, what's his name, Leon Smith in this case here. It didn't work out right. But even someone like J.R. Smith, I think he was a high school guy too, wasn't he? J.R. Yeah, Smith, right. Smith like played 14 years in the league. Amir How Johnson long did Gerald too. Green? Gerald Green, too. Gerald Green. Know. Another guy. Yeah. Another guy, you know, Dwight. Like, so I'm sitting here looking at here, and I'm wondering, going back to the tax, because they didn't have to play those college games, I do wonder if, in this case, they just got straight to your point, you know, Mac, about the strength and conditioning. They got to deal with the pro style. And they have to run around playing 35 games, in this case, in college. with you know, with, with now Most college colleges now are, like, pretty high level. But even those days, there was a difference in the NBA and college programs, like top programs, even then. Um, so I do wonder, in some ways, it's actually helped them and have much more enduring and longer careers than some other guys. I don't know. It's, it's something to think about because, like, I think a lot of times everyone thinks about the, the negatives when it comes to high school players. But a lot of times, a lot of the high school players are the ones that play some of the longest careers that we can think of. Well, I'm, I'm just – I guess I'm curious how – because, like, AAU has changed oh, mm -hmm. since then. And I don't remember it like there's so much focus on getting your kid into the NBA or into the pros now and so much so that like they will even hop teams in AAU like within a weekend even. And so I'm wondering, I have to look at the history of it a little bit more or find someone who's a bit more of an expert in that. But like, I'm, I'm curious because I'm, I don't think that LeBron played the same type of schedule that say Bronny James has. Right. Well, here's now, I'll, here's the other thing that might be actually easier to, to maybe analyze in the future. How is the G League and the elite leagues now play into this? Because, you know, going back to Max's point, now you've got them in your system and your programs and your, and your nutrition and everything else from now. Does that kind of save some of the, you know, we talked about the odometer a little bit now on the back end. And I'm going to be curious to see how some of these players that just come out here, be it Jalen Green or the Twins or whomever it might be, how they respond. You know, you know, fortunately, they all have like, you know, double digit um, years in the league and, and see if they held up okay when it comes to health from that standpoint. That would be fascinating to see. 
coach thoughts? Whenever when I used to coach a fair amount, whether it was like high school or provincial club team, I used to hate if I saw we get to play five games in a weekend or four games in two days. I don't mind the three games in two days. You play one game, maybe when you arrive, and then you get two games like the next day. Um, it's a lot. It's taxing on your ligaments. It's taxing on your joints. Um, depending on the floor, I don't know whenever you guys played, some gyms have like the rubber clay floor. And if you fall on that or if you run on that, that hurts. Some gyms just, you know, it, 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 it's unforgiving. I'll just put it that way. So I know, I think it was Ken, you brought it up, like, you know, when you're changing so much as a, a young male or a young female and stuff like that, you know, it's a fair amount of tax on your body playing all these games. So we're starting to see that from the AAU circuit. Um, some of these injuries that are coming out later, or um, if you've played a ton of basketball as a kid, right up to your about 18, 19, and then try to play a ton of basketball, you know, when you're at the highest level, stuff like that. That's going to eventually take its, its toll on your body. The only guy I've seen has been somewhat of an Iron Man to that is LeBron James. But he also spends a million dollars in the offseason on his body, too, as well, which certainly helps. May I suggest another possibility that also is actually uh, contributing to this a little bit? And I think the NBA has to look at this, maybe just coaches and GMs who are Style of play. Like, is is there a point from a science standpoint, sports science, is there only so fast we can play a game? Right? Like, if, you know, if you're going to have all these possessions in a game and now you're asking six foot ten dudes, that's why sometimes when I look at the old dudes, man, I watch the old dudes play in this case here. Like, you know, as much as they want to talk big, like, oh, so much tougher back then. Look, yeah, in some ways it was more physical, but when it comes down to it, we all play hoops in this case. If a guy just pounding you in the post for five, you know, for, for, for a possession, it might seem like it's rougher. Yeah, in some ways the joints are different you're dealing with, like back injuries and stuff of that nature. But from a movement standpoint, you're sitting in the same spot pretty much for 24 seconds. You know, now I'm now rotating from the post out to the corner three. I got to make a second rotation perhaps. How much mileage in this case they take a guy like Coloco has to make and seven foot one? Body ain't meant to do that. <laughs> it just it's, it's not meant for a guy that size to be running around chasing guys off a three point line. Like I do wonder how much that has to do with it as well too. Like at some points, like guys, man, we can't keep. It, it just it's just not it's, it's just not possible in this case here. I don't know how you how you regulate. It's not like football where you tell, you know you, you make certain penalties that guys don't get tomahawk across the middle anymore. <laughs> it's like that was the old days, and the guy's losing his helmet as he catches the ball. So they, everyone can catch across the middle now. So they've regulated that type of shot out. You know, Ronnie Locke couldn't survive today. However, basketball wise, there's no equivalent to it. I don't know how you kind of like, you know, kind of, like, you know, kind of like work that out of the game. I think there's just a strategy that you can't escape from if everyone's going to shoot threes all day long. I think uh, uh, a thing that they could look into is maybe shortening the season or trying to eliminate as much back-to-backs as possible because then that would put a little bit more rest, more more treatment in between games. Because sometimes they're playing two games, like three games in four nights, and you're this is high level. You're facing the best of the best. guys who are, Imagine having to face Steph one game, then the next game you're facing Anthony Edwards, and then the next game you're facing John Morant. And like These guys are like going full throttle at you all game and we're looking at the star players here that are getting these major injuries because they're playing the most minutes they're out there the most and they're susceptible to more more things happening to them because they're on the court so i think the nba really needs to look into because i don't see why why does there have to be that many back-to-backs in a season like why not start this season earlier or end it a little later what like what's the problem it's money, right? It's, I, yeah, I was I was gonna say it, you want to fit in the Drake concert, the NHL, the thing, <laughs> all of those into one building and make your money. Yeah, like if the NBA has to change the schedule, first they have to talk to Gary Bettman in the NHL because the two have to do it in partnership and figure mm-hmm. out how they can actually shorten each of their seasons. Um, because obviously, you know, to Kenyon's point, you're fighting for spaces for the, for the venue, and then there's all sorts of arena politics that get involved in it, right? Who's the who's the A tenant versus the B tenant? Now, a lot of times in the league, the A tenant is the NBA team. However, there are a few exceptions where the the, the NBA team is the B tenant, like in this city. <laughs> so, and it gets a little sticky at that point here, right? There's a couple. I guess Boston's the same way, where technically the Bruins are the A tenant. You know, 
you know, uh, there's a couple of Chicago, like probably the same way too. I think the Blackhawks probably the A tenant. So there's a few of them like that, but there's not many of them. But if you're going to do so, you're going to work out with the NHL because I don't think Gary Bettman, they're not in the same financial situation in the NBA. They can afford to be cutting games. <laughs> it's like we need every so, piece of so, so do you think stretching out the season is a possibility so that there's less? I think you, I think you can cut back to a certain extent to like say 70 games and still be okay. Let's put it that way from a money standpoint. Now, will the owners want to do, not do so? I doubt that, but that goes back to what they're doing now. The way I would have done it was, you know, I would say, okay, if I'm the players, like you want your NBA in-game tournament, cut off 10 games, and that could be your, you know, and then you could make the tournament, you know, make up the rest of the games or, so, or some portion of the rest of the games or some, some trade-off of that nature where some of the games are in, 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 in-game stuff. But, like, I got something in this case we're going to talk about another time in another podcast of like broadcasting and how they handle that. And I think this speaks to some of that as well, too, because, but, you know, because they do have to change the, um, they do have to change the mindset and, and, and the strategy, of how they present the game. I think now people are just not going to be sitting around for 82 games to watch that. Baseball is even worse, obviously. Hockey's in the same boat. Like, it, there's, a, there's a reason why EPL is doing well in America. It's 30 games, it's on essentially every time on the same night, Sundays. Saturdays and Sundays, boom. And they have like their own Monday night game where the big game of the week is, just like American football, and they're out the door. Yeah. And that's how people are consuming things. Yeah. yeah I, I, just to go into the other examples, so LeBron, obviously with AD, um, uh, as we were talking before this, you know, he's always been looking for someone to, you know, hand a mantle to both uh, as a, you know, please <laughs> help a brother out kind of a thing, but also from other standpoints as well. And it's just, you know, I, like I remember last year leading up to the year, they were saying like AD is going to be the the offense is going to be focused around AD. And I'm like, man, this man can't hold, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> this man can't hold up, well, and he like, didn't. Like you sell your boy in LA or, <laughs> or, or in Florida, if that's the case. Yeah, he's here exactly. Um, obviously, we've already talked about Kawhi. Um, I think the two other good examples are uh, Giannis. I think you will see uh, that more and more coming up, especially with Drew uh, Middleton and Brooke Lopez. Like they're they're. You know they're rubbing, you know, Tiger Bomb on their knees and and icy hot or whatever every single night, uh, trying to make it through an eighty two game season. And they're good; they they can kind of they were able to cruise through it, but it's getting tougher. It's getting a lot tougher. Um, and I think the other interesting team in terms of Eastern Conference. I, I mean, if you guys have Western Conference examples as well, we could talk about those because you know I I know that the. Uh, Phoenix might be interesting uh, coming up, um, but it would be uh, Boston, uh, especially their big men rotation. Rob Williams, uh, you have Al Horford, who they've been trying to save, and yeah. now they've added the man, the myth, the legend with plantar fasciitis, which is not the most serious thing, but still it's like already you're worried about a guy who – struggles to really go into the post um struggles with knee issues um is an offensive weapon but they they don't really have a mid-range threat who's willing to go and and go in the mid-range i'm kind of curious to see what happens to boston uh thoughts on all of that well just to go back to phoenix for a second that's actually already happening like booker has been a pretty durable player but in the last couple of years where he's had to kind of take up the load for Chris Paul, and now he's got to deal with another old man, and now he's got Bradley Beal, who's always like you know pretty much a like, like paper mache in this case here. Watch Booker because like if he goes down for any sort of time, it's a wrap for Phoenix. He's the one guy they can't do without. They can get away with the other guys in this case; they're missing games, but they're missing Booker. <laughs> it's, it's over. Yeah, and in the terms of the Celtics, there's something about big guys and foot issues. It's been a thing in the NBA. There's a his, there's a history of big time players, like, or, or I should say, centers and power forwards with foot injuries. Now you take Robert Williams; he's had a lot of knee issues. Guy's only young too, right? And you get Porzingis is it, beyond those from from being a Mavericks fan. How frustrating I'm sure it can be when you have this very talented seven foot three guy who can do a lot, but if you can get sixty games out of him, consider it. A bonus, right? And now he's got plantar fasciitis, which is not which is not something you want as a big guy. And then you have Al Horford, um, you know, who 
on the last legs. Mac? Yeah, I, I, on the Mavericks thing, I think Luca is one that we have to look out for, right? The, he's going to be carrying. He's been carrying the load a lot for that team, and you, we know Kyrie's history. Um, he'll be in and out of games. He's an excellent player, but he has a history to miss a few games every season. So somebody like Luca, someone I don't want to speak on it, and then it happens. Uh, so I'll knock on wood. I don't know. <laughs> but but like. That that's the one you have to look out for, and again, it comes down to roster construction again. Because what do they really build around him? I'm not as concerned about Luke as some other guys because Luke is very similar to me, like LeBron, and his style of play. Like he makes uh, it look kind pace, of his pace, his pace yeah, like yeah. he can get sped up by nobody. And it's like you know he's gonna do a little up and under move, boom off the glass. We know he can take a little rest on defense. Let's be honest. Okay, <laughs> this is true. Oh, what it is? Okay, <laughs> he ain't fighting over any screens. I tell you that he times. <laughs> hey man, he's my boy, man. But I gotta call it the way I see it, man. Just for you folks out here, think I play favorites, man. I go after my old man here. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think. So this is why I think it's interesting. The Luca point is, is interesting because we talked about ISO ball the other day. I'll probably link that in the description down below. But I think if you're not going to play ISO ball if you, or if you want to go away from heliocentrism as your main focal point of like how you construct an NBA offense in the modern day, I'm kind of curious. Like it, it seems like maybe to avoid injury, perhaps going towards more versatile styles where you can play several different styles throughout the course of a uh, let's say just even a series um if you were going to go with that that probably um potentially could take some you know, you know you know give give miles back to the odometer i i you know i i wouldn't say roll it back because we we've all probably here uh, we're old enough to see uh ferris bueller and we know what happens if you put the card reverse <laughs> it didn't work didn't work people uh for those of you who are younger viewers do not do that if you drive your parents car do not put it in reverse because the odometer will go up still um uh, but yeah That's sorry a reference i had the last 24 hours by the way i just say that in this case I'm sorry this is the second Bueller reference i had in the last really yeah, the movie. Uh, but to your point, I just wonder a little bit, are we talking about two different things? Because for a fatigue standpoint, I totally agree with you in this case here that, that you know, having more diversity. But I think that one of the things we discussed in our previous conversation about ISO ball, the ISO guys tend to stay pretty healthy. And I think because they can control their own pace of what they can and cannot do. Harden's issue is more fatigue maybe in the playoffs, perhaps, to Max's point and your point. But it's not injuries. Harden's usually pretty healthy. They are. I mean, I think I saw somewhere where Harden's like up there in the most minutes besides LeBron, like in the last 10 or 15 years. Or so, like, LeBron yeah. plays a lot like that. Luca doesn't get hurt. Like, Luca's just out there, wakes up in the morning, has a cup of coffee, and you go to play 40 minutes, like, or whatever. You know, so, I, so the me, I do wonder if that style of play, even though it's not the best style of play overall for your team, from a health standpoint, it may not be the worst. Siakam plays a lot. So, he plays more than most team players in the league. Yeah, it's pretty healthy all the time. <laughs> yeah, I think I think part of that comes from so it's just in general one of the things we didn't talk about is that it's just easier to okay finding a guy that you can do ISO around is hard, but like once you get that star, like mm -hmm. and, and especially with the way that the the league's going in a way, in terms of like from the financial side of things. It's easier to buy specialists and get specialists if you're not Maasai and, and don't wait forever. So, you know, aside from that, I think it's easier to get these different specialty things to build around a heliocentric star to probably fill that out. But that, yeah, I mean, I I do hear you. I think it, the pacing allows the individual to to probably save more miles off their body. But the problem is, is if that individual ever goes down, you're screwed. Uh, I mean, I mean, <laughs> like if we're comparing, if we're comparing Doncic and and Siakam as far as like usage, mm -hmm. right? Doncic led the league in usage. It was like forty one oh, yeah. percent usage rate. And, yeah, and yeah. Pascal's usage rate was twenty eight point eight. So it's like there's a gap there. Well, you know, I, and I, I know they play different. They play different styles, of course. Oh, yes, but they, but they both have the ball in their hands in the heliocentric way a lot of times as well too. So what I'm saying is they can control and decide how much jeopardy they want to put their body in on any particular possession compared to say golden state 
who's going to run Clay and, and, and Steph off a of pick after pick. You catch your elbow in the wrong place. Good luck. It's for ironic that yeah. Golden State, those two guys have had like season ending injuries in both their careers. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're less likely to run into an illegal screen if you have the ball in their head and you're kind of going <laughs> down. You don't worry about that. You don't worry about back <laughs> and catch, a, catch someone on the other side, right? You know, there's yeah. less traffic there. You know where you have to go to get your sweet spot. I'm, you know? I'm just looking up Rip Hamilton just to see because I'm, I'm like that's the person that I'm thinking about from like olden days is like but like he was actually pretty healthy. Now True. obviously the cutting then is different than the cutting now. He um, also had to wear a mask that he lost about 40, 50 games because you guys face rearranged that that too. <laughs> there. <laughs> So it's either the knees or it's the face, right? It's uh, <laughs> you can get it somewhere. That's all I'm saying. Which, right? which money maker are you willing to lose? Yeah, uh, like, <laughs> I just say it is the case. I'm just saying there's certain guys I do question a little bit, like like the like the way they play does help them from a health, health standpoint. Now, to your point, I don't know if it helps successfully win series or games, or in this case, the fatigue factor. Hey, Jimmy Butler's another guy that plays a lot of ISO. I want to. I this is way off topic, and coach, I want to tag you in in a second. But I, I am kind of curious, and I have to like look into this. Like, what is the incident for? I don't know, knee issues versus ankle issues versus whatever throughout the years. And I'm wondering what I like. I've never really. I, it's tracked somewhere, but I've never looked at it personally. And I, I'd be curious to, you know, look at it. Um, you know, just from a more. Is my academic background and nerdy side talking? Um, because I am I am kind of curious to see like has that and 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 correlate it with pace of play. But uh coach, thoughts. Well, I think kind of our discussion is if you're someone you play a lot of minutes and you play well into the season, i.e. championship, you you know, I think. I, I'm certainly not a doctor in sports science, but eventually you're going to wear down. Michael Jordan, from 1987 to 1993, played 40 minutes a night and won, started winning championships in 91, then they won in 92, went to the Olympics, came back, won in 93. The dude said, I'm tired. I, maybe there's some other things too in there, but he's, he said on the Netflix documentaries, like, I was tired. I was wore out. I was just exhausted by that time. You take a guy like LeBron too. Like this guy is literally an Iron Man, going to eight straight finals or whatever he did, and he won a couple there. Like it's it's amazing those two are were able to do what they did. I don't like Bill Russell. I guess in the sixties too, I, it was a little, the game was a little bit different than not as rigorous with travel and stuff like that. But the more minutes that you play. And the more times that you're going well into the, the playoffs and the finals, like you're eventually going to wear down stuff like that. So I'll I'm, make a I'm, quick point here. Um, and not to turn this because I, I know everyone wants to turn things into like LeBron versus Jordan kind of crap. Yeah. And but, I'm not trying to do that. Yeah. No, 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 no. I don't worry. Um, but it's, it's interesting because like Jordan's version of taking, you know, a couple, you know, the time off to go play baseball, Yep. is kind of like LeBron taking, you know, whatever he's done during the season. And I'm kind of curious, like, how much, you know, if you could rerun the simulation and Jordan never took time off, like, you know, does his body hold up throughout the, the second thing? I'm really curious. Um, That's a good question. I doubt it. Yeah. Because let's yeah. face it, look, look what happened to the other guys that made the run. Pippen was a shell of himself by the time he got the third one. You know, like, I mean, there's other guys in this case, too, that were on that team or, or other guys that in this case here, even were in the first run, they're already starting to hang on. So, like, I don't – like, when you play that long, man, like, it's another season when you play in the playoffs. It's like two seasons when you play that. Like, and then the way with the intensity and stuff like that. Like, like it's like dog years. I think someone described it, one of the players in this case. I don't know if it was Isaiah Thomas or someone. Said, when you play playoffs, it's like, it's so wherever you think it is for the regular season, I like, feels like another three years playing the right, if you get the finals. Like, you know, so going back to the funny, if we start with Murray in this case here, going back to Murray's point, which is the quote he had there. Yeah, man, when you play a series like that, man, it, I found it amazing that he was even considering that. I was like, really? You know, in this day and age, how they play? And I think that's the style of play is the other thing, too. I think Jordan, in some ways, could get away with what he's doing because he had another player that could take on the defensive assignments that he didn't have to take on. And also, too, the way in the style of play was, is like you're only moving a certain percentage of the, of the court. You have to run out for guys in three-point shots. How many three-pointers guys were taking? 
It was only like eight guys were three point bombers, and they weren't even considered bombers even at that time considered to date. Well, even like, defensively, right. like you couldn't double team, and they found right. kind of a cheat way around that with with Pippen. But it's just like still Pat, like yeah. like Pascal Siakam takes what three threes a game, four threes a game. Yeah, yeah, and then that then that would be probably more than anybody on the Bulls team in that time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's it's so. I mean, there's there's a lot of directions that I want to take this. Um, what I'll say is this for the Raptors, I am kind of curious to see what happens. Um, I don't, you know, Siakam's fairly healthy. I think he actually does take care of his body, uh, a lot. Um, you know, and I don't think it gets enough talk, but I will say this. If he goes down for any, (laughs) you know, extended period of time, you have two guys who have injury issues one is who's younger in a scotty barnes where he has all these tendonitis you know ankle things and then you have og who as we discussed we got Jalen mcdaniels who's basically og insurance um and then you know, auto's auto so you have a bunch of guys who are i'm really curious to see what happens because that puts a lot more pressure on them thank goodness you have a guy that takes care of his body, um, but I'm still, you know, and also thank goodness he's not having to play center as much. But yeah, I'm kind of curious. Uh, who wants to jump in? On that? Oh, someone with that? I think anyone could jump in. <laughs> Coach, you want to go or? Oh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll say. Um, I think getting. Hurdle will take a lot of the physical toll off of Siakam. Mean, how many times do we see him guarding someone probably about 40 pounds heavier than him and about three inches taller before Pirtle had shown up? And OG was doing the same thing. I think they even commented after they acquired Pirtle. I think they said, like, yeah, now I don't have to guard Embiid or go and guard, like, you know, some of the Stephen Adams and stuff like that in the NBA. And really, they shouldn't be. That's kind of the flawed nature of what they were doing. Anyway, that's a different discussion. But um, I, I do think that if Siakam is not trying to guard these, you know, big bruising guys who are quite physical, that's one, you know, one way to prevent some things from from happening to him in terms of injuries. Um, just that that physical toll, specifically with him. Um, but it, it's just back to your point about today's game. It's so versatile. And all guarding the perimeter, guarding inside, it's it's a lot. Siakam, what I'm trying to say is Siakam's going to do that anyway. So at least don't have him guarding Adams or Embiid or Jokic some of these big physical centers, because you're going to have to have this guy for 75 plus games this year, hopefully. Yeah. Geez. I wonder why his uh, defensive numbers dropped. Um, so (laughs) (laughs) wonder why, um, but yeah, uh, Mac, uh, any thoughts? Um, we'll, we'll probably go, go close to a close of of this, but, uh, cause I think we've talked this one out, but yeah. Um, any, any thoughts? I mean, on the Siakam front, I think, it might sound weird, but I think this team is better equipped to help him defensively than it was last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we're underrating. I think we're a little bit underrating the Dennis signing and the Jalen signing. Maybe not you guys, but I think uh, the fan base as a whole are really not really um, taking you. in what's really <laughs> happening with this team. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, check the last episode, people, of Basketball Rewind. We did do a full episode on Jalen McDaniels. Uh, but yes, no, continue on. Thank you, Matt. Thank yes. you. <laughs> yes, you guys are correct. <laughs> but yeah, like and, and look at it. Like you have you have Grady uh, as someone who's going to provide some spacing for Siakam offensively. Because um, what people don't realize, well, again, people do realize it, but not everyone. But like Siakam's more than a s- score, right? And when you have offensive engines, as I think of him as, like he's an offensive engine. He brings those double teams. He brings those. Th- you need to build around that. And what we we haven't done a good job of that lately. So if Lord willing, Otto can give us at least forty games this year. That's a lot to ask for. <laughs> you have you have Grady coming in as a three point shooter. Um, you know, I think I still think we need some uh, some shooting up front 
as far as the, the center's position. Maybe like not even a guy like a Muscala, somebody who's not gonna play every game, but in certain situations, if you the floor is shrinking a little bit. You could throw him out there, Kelly Olinick type, you know, who can kind of stretch things out because I don't <laughs> think Coloco's there yet. <laughs> you know, so for PJ Washington for a while, man. <laughs> exactly. PJ would be pre- is he still a free agent? I think he is. Yes. He is, t- he is definitely. <laughs> yes. Oh no, what are we doing, guys? Cleveland, Cleveland. Uh, j- just for the viewers, uh, when this is filmed, uh, Cleveland most recently has shown interest, and they they might be signing him to an offer sheet or Remove. something like that. But we will see. We will see. Um, uh, you know, perhaps Bobby could uh, make a phone call. Um, but he does want twenty million. Um, anyways, I don't know what Charlotte would want. Um, uh, but I, if there was a way to try to get him, I would be trying to get him and using him over. I mean, my. His, you know, my default trade demand would be Fad and Boucher. I think that's everyone's default trade. I mean, they could have Precious too, and we're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I might throw in Precious if, if necessary, um, just to just sweeten the pot. But my, my main thing is that the guy can play. He, uh, you know, he, he can do multiple things on offense defensively. I know it's it's a wing, but I think if you can like consolidate your wing depth, send some of it out and kind of like get a better version of what you're trying to get, he would be very very like him and Jalen McDaniels have played together before. I'm kind of I I more of a four to me. Yeah, well, but when I say sorry, when I say wing depth like forward wing, you okay. know, switchability. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, he can get his own shot. He's a smart player um i think he plays well he, he would fit now like he really would fit but it's just i know um yeah we don't think that broad and that imaginative don't worry about yeah it, no <laughs> we're not we're not that sophisticated on this uh no. on this team at times so. <laughs> that's not our front office <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I'm, mac you finish your point because i wanted to kind of jump on um your point actually about the about the rest of the roster for a second but i'm not sure if you had anything else oh, no, I'm, I, yeah, I'm done you can you can go ahead you can go ahead um, your points about Grady and the two free agent acquisitions, I think the me and that kind of dovetails back to the original question from um, from from hopeful is um, I think I I look at the opposite way. I don't think pressure is on Scotty and OG because I'm always I'm of the mindset of my philosophy in sports is there's some guys are just injury prone prone players. It doesn't matter what sport it is. Some guys are just chronically injured, and it is what it is. So I have already, ta- I've already put that tax into this season. That that there's going to be 30 games that OG's going to lose. I'm sorry. I know you OG fans out there don't want to hear that, but that's just the way it is. I ain't asking for anyone to get hurt. I've just watched it for six years. I am just prepared for that already. So if you book the 30 games in, to me, the guys, the pressure is on actually the guys in this case that Matt mentioned: Grady, Dennis, Jalen. Or Jaden, we got Jaden, right? Jaden. Oh, it's gonna Jaylen. Drive me. Is Jalen we got? It's Jalen. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's gonna drive me crazy all year. Jalen. So those three to me, because those guys in this case here, they right now we don't know about Grady, but Grady's has shown no no sort of past history of like uh being injured or anything like that or being injury prone. And so is the other two guys. I said for the moment, Shooter picked up one of the benefits of Shooter is Shooter plays all day. Shooter plays all night. You never have to worry about that with Shooter. <laughs> He's going to play. All right. So you got that plus McDaniels and him. Those three guys I'm gonna, we're going to count on because I think they're going to get a ton of minutes because I'm just of the assumption that there's going to be 30 games we ain't going to see OG. And now we're in year three of Scotty. And he's already got some chronic issues already. Like, you know, and they're looking to ramp up his responsibilities. I ain't wishing for it, but don't tell me if I'm not surprised sometime around Christmas all of a sudden. We got like a week or two and Scotty's out. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. I ain't asking for it, folks. I'm just saying we've seen this story before in many circumstances. And I'm just sitting here like, you know, shocked. Porzingis got hurt in this case. The moment he got to Boston, right? <laughs> Did anyone get shot by that? I would have gone up to Vegas myself and the casino down the street put money on that. In this case, he's going to get hurt by the first two, two or three months of the season. Some guys are just like that, man. <laughs> I don't know. Vegas has betting on that. People don't bet on that. I'll just say this: we don't you know, know that. 
yeah. <laughs> some bootleg, you know, distributor or something like that. They make a bet on anything. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure that there there is a a, do a back room somewhere in no, Vegas say, that you can definitely. Play, like, uh, how many minutes or how many games X players gonna play this year? It's essentially the I mean, back I mean, room say the same thing. <laughs> Mac, you were in Vegas. Uh, did you? Did you, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was this there was this yeah. alleyway. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or you, you said you said that you had the the driver that said don't go here go here right so maybe yeah, yes. maybe he knew what was up he was like <laughs> listen c- 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 come to c- you know after you're done come to my shop and you know we'll we'll yeah, set you yeah. up with the right with the real betting um so yeah with that being said people um yeah i mean i i i guess there's not really much else to say i will say this again to kind of circle all the way back to the other teams with a league in parity i would be looking at the teams that have made multiple long playoff runs and see how they hold up this season it'll be very interesting uh, miami is one that i'm kind of a little bit concerned because we already know kyle lowry is nearing the end of kyle lowry um as an nba player um so I think we'll 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 see. There's other teams as well. We already talked about some Boston and, and other teams. Um, well, on the flip side, other teams got healthier, deeper, et cetera, et cetera. So we will see what happens. But either way, stay tuned on Basketball Rewind. Beyond, you were going to say something. I just wanted to mention your point about the the teams that had long playoff runs. Steve mm. Kerman made a point literally two weeks ago. We talked about Chris Paul. Oh, and we sure. have to play differently. In other words, he sees what's happened with the Splash Brothers. So yeah. in other words, that was his way of saying, like, this, we can't continue having these guys play like this. We're going to need someone to take the load and maybe play some two-man game to kind of give these guys a break so they're not running around all over the place in this case. So that was his code of saying the same thing in some ways, to your point, about teams that usually have long playoff runs. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really, really curious. Uh, I think that they'll be an interesting team. I think they might be better, but they need Chris Paul. They they need Chris Paul on that team uh, more than people think that they do, um, and that's kind of the best team for Chris Paul because he can kind of you know rehab and keep his body, you know, sort of in a chamber, Dragon Ball Z style, if he needs to for for some time in the season. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love the moves they've made. I won't shock me if they finish first in in the West next year. I like Sarge. Chris Paul. I think is definitely needed. Trace Jackson Davis, great pick. Uh, by them, Podzimski too. His kid can just he just falls. He can just shout out, flat out shoot. They made some. I think they made some good moves. So yeah, uh, final thoughts for everyone. And also, Mac, do you have anything that you want to plug? Oh, uh, as far as uh, I don't know, I have some stuff I'm playing with for this <laughs> week's episode of Running Off the Screen. I don't know yet. Uh, we'll keep it a surprise. Um, you know. You guys do a great job of banter and and spreading like knowledge, but also having it like a, a almost like a bar conversation. You know, like it's it's a smart um, friendship based conversation, and I think it's gonna it's gonna blow up if you guys stay consistent. I really appreciate it. I, I like these other two people. So <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a it's a great job. Like I've I've missed the last couple episodes. I kind of fell off the grid. I I haven't been tweeting or doing anything. I'm just family mode in the summer. But uh, from what I've seen, you guys do a great job. So uh, keep it up. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, and with that being said, I'll also give people a little bit of a preview, uh, depending on when this comes out. Um, one of a Scotty episode or another episode might be coming out um, uh, after this one. Um, I haven't decided yet, so we'll see. Something, uh, it, it'll be a surprise. But I do have some some episodes saved in the chamber, as always, just, uh, just in case. Um, I will be here covering FIBA as much as I can, people. I am in study mode, um, but I still will find time for the game that I love. Um, and so, yeah, um, I will be linking Max podcast down below. Definitely give him a, 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 you know, whether it's a share, whether it's a comment, whether it's a, I think for, uh, for the non YouTube side of things, uh, a rating, uh, which we don't do. We either do thumbs up or thumbs down on, on YouTube. Uh, give all the love to, to Matt. Cause honestly, uh, his podcast is really good. It, I, the way that I describe it is it's kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say ASMR kind of a thing, but it's, <laughs> it's a, it's a very <laughs> dynamic audio experience 
is what I will say. And uh, I, there's a lot that I would love to learn uh, and pick his brain about with audio because I've been hearing you people. I will be turning up the audio for this one for sure. Um, with that being said, uh, Coach Beyond, do you have anything that you guys want to plug before we get out of here? No, nah, man, just to check out Basketball Rewind. That's about it. Um, with that being said, it's been fun. So everyone, uh, wherever you are, take care. Take care of yourself and uh, peace.